Thank you, Blaine. Your Thanksgiving address is a perfect way to welcome us into this moment. Thank you. Give me another round of applause. Good morning, I'm Melissa Brown. I'm the director of the Buffalo History Museum and I was glad to see many of you last night at our uh, opening evening event and I've also had the great honor of serving as co-chair with Terry Abrams for this year's conference. I hope you're enjoying Buffalo and ASLH's Right Here, Right Now, the Power Place Conference uh, so far. The Right Here, Right Now is a nod to our beloved Bills coach, Marv Levy's quote, where else would you rather be than right here, right now? So I have to have my go Bills. We're definitely right moving into the season very quickly. Um, but what a treasure to be here together. And the program committee did an outstanding job creating this array of experiences for us to share in. My gratitude to Bethany and her team at ASLH for this opportunity and all of their support. And to our host committee, which if you could raise your hands, because um, I know many of you are here, our host committee that has worked so diligently to give you a glimpse of our Buffalo and what we love about this region and New York State. Yes. And we all know sponsorship is critical to get creating a gathering like this. Um, so I'd like to first thank our session sponsor, Conservation Center for Art and Historic Artifacts. Thank you. I'd also like to give a special nod to the New York State Council for the Arts for their support of scholarships. This year they supported $28,000 worth of scholarships to have people attend and participate in this conference, which we know these conversations are important and we know because of our budgets that it's often hard money to find to make space for these um, for, to be able to share in something like this. So I thank them and I thank Erica Sanger and her work through Manny um, in making that happen. So um, another round of applause, please. So I'd now like to welcome up my co-chair, Terry Abrams, um, to introduce our keynote speaker. Thank you all and uh, enjoy, enjoy your time. I look forward to seeing you more over the coming days. Where else would you rather be? Right. So, uh, thank you all. I want to thank you all for coming. Uh, it has been a long uh, process in, in bringing uh, you here to Buffalo. Uh, I attended the 2008 conference in Rochester, and I thought at the time, if they can have it in Rochester, why not Buffalo? And 14 years later, here we are. So, um, so. It is uh, my distinct privilege to introduce our, our keynote speaker. Uh, I've known him for a long time, uh, and in fact, when he was a, a professor at the University of Buffalo, he actually taught my mother, uh, my, who is 96. <laughs> although although she, she, was, uh, she was an older student at the time, so Rick, Rick didn't teach her when she was young, so he, <laughs> uh, But I, and I am, uh, so like I said, I've known Rick for a long time, and I'm now placed in the uh, awkward and uh, un unusual situation of actually having to say nice things about him in his presence. So, um, Rick Hill, uh, he is a citizen of the Beaver Clan of the Tuscarora Nation of the Haudenosaunee at Grand River. Uh, he holds a master's degree in American studies from the State University of New York at Buffalo. He is the former assistant director for public programs, the National Museum of the American Indian, Smithsonian Institution, uh, the museum director, uh, the Institute of American Indian Arts in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Uh, he is assistant professor of the Native American Studies program at SUNY Buffalo. Uh, formerly, he served as the senior project director of the De Yohang, a indigenous senior project uh, coordinator of, the, uh, what, sorry. Formerly, he served as senior project coordinator of the, of the De Yohang, indigenous knowledge center at Six Nations Polytechnic Institute, which a long, really a long uh, a title to have. <laughs> I'm not sure how that would fit on a nameplate. Um, uh, currently, he is working with a group of historians on a book on the history and legacy of the Mohawk Institute, the oldest Indian residential school in Canada. He is the Indigenous Innovation Specialist at Mohawk College in Hamilton and serves as a cultural advisor to FNTI in the Tyendinaga Mohawk Territory. 
Uh, he's the, the father of eight daughters. And I, I would have to say, I venture to say that uh, at, he has, you know, obviously uh, been around for a while and, and uh, done a lot of things in a lot of different arenas. I know that he is a uh, proficient artist as well. Um, and I would venture to say that at this point in time, he is probably one of the most respected uh, Haudenosaunee intellectuals uh, in our community. And I know that a lot of us uh, respect him greatly for his knowledge and his wisdom. Uh, so without further ado, Rick Hill. Nyawaiskano, uh, from me to all of you, that I'm uh, thankful that you're well. Uh, Terry, you should remind your mother, see, she still owes me a paper from her <laughs> time at the university. Uh, I got to uh, confess that when I woke up this morning and my bones were aching, I said, why did I ever agree to go to Buffalo today? <laughs> but it's because of our co-hosts, we're quite uh, persuasive. And to tell you the truth, I have this great affection for this, uh, this organization. Many years ago, I worked at the Buffalo Historical Museum where you were last night, uh, enjoying the dancing, I included one of my daughters. And uh, she, she called me when she got done. And she says, they said you're gonna do a speech tomorrow. I said, yeah. And um, she says, why? I said, well, to tell you the truth, I'm addicted to museums. I'm a recovering museum addict. <laughs> I love going to museums. Uh, historical societies, historic sites, archives, wherever anybody's talking about what took place there at that. So I'm here to feed my addiction and share with a few ideas from you of what I think about as a result of all of this. Now I call it Ongwe Ongwe place. Ongwe Ongwe, that's our word for the original people, the first people that walked this land. And we've been walking this land uh, uh, for many, many years. Now I don't know, uh, oh here it is. Let's see if this works. And that concludes my discussion for today. <laughs> Thank you. All right. So at the museum, some of you may have noticed this on a mantle going upstairs. There's this expression there that they said, when I worked there, 1974, I, I was fascinated by this and a little infuriated by it. Because every day I went to work, it assumes that our council fires are no longer working that they've been replaced by something else. But I can tell you that blue has replaced everything. <laughs> so, I don't know what I did wrong. Uh, okay, one, that's, oops. This is why you should never let old people handle technology. So before I came here, I asked uh, two Seneca speakers uh, how would you translate that phrase that's up uh, on that mantle? And basically, they said, it really means, literally, here is where a fire once lay. Here there was a fire. There used to be a fire here. Doesn't mean it's no longer here, but there used to be one right here. There used to be one over here. There used to be one over there. We have had our fires burning. Let me see if I got this right. Ah, all right, I got it. Up is down. Our home fires have been burning all across the state of New York for thousands of years. We are the people of the longhouse. We lived in these long houses. Imagine what it must have been like to live in a single home with all of your mother's relatives. <laughs> yeah, I know. I don't know about you, my relatives, I love to see them come and visit. You know, but after the third day, I'm saying, gee, don't you have somewhere to go? But back then, a man like me, when you married somebody, you moved into your wife's longhouse, which changed the whole social dynamic. The man couldn't get away with crap because uh, their mother, <laughs> their aunt, their aunts, or, and, her, and her brothers would make sure. And in fact, if you acted up too much, you'd try to come home one day and all your goods would be wrapped up in a little bundle outside the door, which basically says, you go back to your mother because she didn't raise you very well. So fortunately, Terry hasn't seen that bundle yet, but uh, the way he's acting, who knows? Who knows what's gonna happen? 
But our council fires, like I say, still burn. Sorry. Oh. At our national capital, the Onondaga Nation, near Syracuse, New York. This is the contemporary longhouse. This is where we meet. This is where our chiefs and our clan mothers gathered together, along with our citizens, to really contemplate our future, to, ne to navigate uh, in the modern politics, to negotiate with agencies about what our future is going to look like, our collective future. So the council fire continues. And I also then would like to do a uh, little bit of acknowledgement, although Blaine covered this quite well. Whenever we start, we always acknowledge the earth is our mother, that we're related to her. And so wherever we go, see, there's that connection to that place. And I think that's very important. So we give thanks to her for everything she provides. And it's like she says, uh, here, this is all for, for you to use. The, the plants, the birds, the animals, the waters, the medicine, all of this stuff, I'm offering it to you. It's a sacred relationship, but it connects us to this place we call the Turtle Island in very profound ways. <clears throat> the other thing I see is that um, when we give thanks that uh, Blaine was talking about, you know, I actually remember Blaine when he was a little kid, you know, uh, acting up, his parents <laughs> chasing him around. So, uh, but Fortunately, he paid attention to what they say. It was a quite beautiful uh, recitation that he did today. I think the Seneca language is one of the most beautiful languages in the world, but now I'm kind of prejudiced. So when we give thanks to all of that, we're reminding us of our connection to this place within the whole universe. That basically, wherever you go, you're at the center of the universe, your, your universe. And so that's why it's important for us to acknowledge these things. Uh, but uh, I forgot to mention uh, who we actually are. So we're the six nations that, you, that we mentioned. Senecas, Cayugas, Onondagas, Oneidas, Mohawks, and Tuscarors were united together in a confederacy. But as you can see by this map, our homelands have been severely diminished. And even once they put us on reservations or reserve, even that land was diminished. In many ways, it disconnected us from our place. My dad's a Mohawk, and he, but he grew up at Grand River uh, near uh, Brantford, Ontario. They're originally from the Mohawk Valley. My mother's a Tuscarora. She grew up at the Tuscarora Nation uh, community near Lewiston, but originally from North Carolina. So we moved around a lot, but we're able to reposition ourselves in the place where we are. Does that make sense? Even though we're not in the homelands of North Carolina or in the Mohawk Valley, this place where we stand, where we do our ceremonies, where we make our homes, and we do raise our children, we plant our corn, that becomes the important place to us. But as you see, we also live all the way across uh, New York, Ontario, Quebec, Wisconsin, and Oklahoma. Who knows how many there are of us? I try my best to improve that population significantly, but... Um, 1% of the Tuscarora Nation lives in my house. <laughs> and, oh, okay. However, that landscape looks very different when you remove all of the names in English, French, and Spanish, and to realize we had a name for every place, every feature, every village. And so in our language says today, they're, they're coming back, they're recovering. Our people are beginning to redefine their place according to the way their grandparents and their ancestors used to define that. And that makes a big difference. Like Buffalo, Doshoa, this place where these uh, basswood trees grow. Now try to find a basswood tree in downtown Buffalo. All right, it's a little awkward here, just trying to make sure I'm on the right page. So I have been at the center of the universe in many different places in North America. Wherever I go visit indigenous people, they always take me to this place and always tell me a story. Here's where everything began. This, this is where our lives began. For a while, I got confused. I said, well, it can't all be true. You know, but it's also like looking at 16 different versions of the Bible that's offered at Six Nations. So, uh, which one is true? Well, they're, they're all true, meaning everybody's story about our place is because we're connected here, and that's what makes it very important. And so our connection to these homelands is really what's important to our people. Oh. Can we go back? Yes. So, 
In the sacred black hills of, of the Dakotas, the Lakota people told me that the landforms here in, the, in their place are directly connected to the stars. There's a mountain over here. You can see the star cluster over here. There's a, there's a place over here connected to the star cluster. It was like the universe was inverted, like a big uh, hourglass. What's over there is down here in the world. And it was amazing to me, the stories that they still had about that connection. I don't know about the text below. I don't know what's going on with that. Uh, <clears throat> in Haida Gwaii, which is also known as British Columbia, I heard stories about how Raven birthed humans. He, it's a clamshell on the beach. He comes, he pecks away, it opens it up, and all of these little humans come running out. And they run off into the, into the uh, beach and into the woods to make these seven large families that still exist there today. And so when you see that raven, it often reminds me, he's kind of a trickster, but he's still there, that he was the one that brought life to the coast. Okay. In Chaco Canyon in New Mexico, I heard stories about the emergence of the Pueblo people from deep within the earth. And they still have these sacred kiva spaces, very ancient places that help them recall their connection to that world below. They enter into this place. And according to some of them, we're going to go on to another place from here. All right. When I was in Hawaii, I heard stories about the, oh, excuse me. When I was in the uh, Cahokia, outside of St. Louis, there's this big mound there. And I stood in the same place where native people have stood for, for centuries as the sun arises over that big mound and connects to these poles that are stuck in the ground to acknowledge the summer solstice, the winter solstice. It's amazing to me that these, uh, my ancestors had this kind of knowledge about those kinds of things, and they celebrated that. The people that lived there have been gone for a long time. Those poles have been replanted into the ground. It's actually a great interpretive center. I, I recommend you all go there. And uh, I was in Hawaii, and the native people there told me about this eternal struggle between the female spirit of the volcano and the male spirit of the big lush valleys. And that creates this mist that falls over the land, life-giving mist. It's like a blessing when it happens to you. So place matters. How you're born in that place matters. And so I began to explore the stories of our connection to place. and to the great blue mystery that keeps following me. <laughs> so one day I stood at Niagara Falls uh, gazing at all this water rolling over, and it's a mystifying place. In my head was rattling this story that I got from uh, old Chief Corbett Sundown from Tonawanda. He told me the story of this woman who was distraught and tried to commit suicide there, but that there were these beings behind the falls that saved her and they removed this snake that was growing inside of her through this medicine. They were called the thunder beings. They're the ones that make thunder and lightning happen to continue to chase that snake away. But I was also sad to learn that the thunder beings moved away. Too many tourists started showing up at Niagara Falls, and so they went to the Rocky Mountains. So uh, sometimes even our spirits need to make an adjustment to the colonizer. But let's go back to the beginning. They tell us that our ancestors, the Ongwe Ongwe, were originally made from the clay of the earth. Literally, they took this clay, shaped this body, and then the creator, the one who made us, who finished our bodies, he breathed into us, that animated us. So when you grow up hearing those stories, your connection to a place is so profound. That's what, that's what it is right there. Well, not right here, but underneath all of this stuff here that that living earth makes our bodies, that living earth makes all of the plants and the animals, and that living earth is, is so uh, connected to us, how could you ever want to sell that? Or how could you ever want to move away from that? Sometimes it's a mystery of what my ancestors were forced to do, but our stories tell us that the Creator put his DNA into us, part of his mind, part of his blood, part of his flesh, and part of his, uh, his uh, breath. And that's why we continue to walk about in this space that Blaine talked about. So 
We call the original people the Ongwe Ongwe. They were given a series of instructions. They're more like, here's your responsibilities in this place. Here's what you need to do. There were two twins born who then kind of fought over what kind of land this was going to be. Is it going to be a place of perpetual regeneration, things come up anew every year, or will it be a place of darkness and death? Fortunately for all of us, the good-minded twin won that contest, and that started our culture, that we're intended to live well in this place of perpetual generation. He also taught us, as Blaine mentioned, about how to plant the three sisters so that they grow together, they can help to sustain us. Hey, that actually worked. Okay. And uh, as was mentioned in our in the land acknowledgement, this dish with one spoon. This is the wampum belt that uh, talks about that. And I have a, a replica of it here. This represents the dish from which all bounty comes. Everything that the Mother Earth wants to share with us. I'll just put that there. Hope they won't fall off. And. Think of it this way, though. It's like, a, it's like a treaty with our mother. This is what we do. This is what she do. So this is why it's important that we maintain our ceremonies and, and continue to speak to her in the language that she understands and that we live according to those original instructions so that we can maintain and share the bounty of this place. So we're told to look to the earth Look to the patterns of nature, the cycles that nature goes through to remind us of the sacredness of this place. Sacred is a real tough word. Sometimes it's an overused word, but it just means it was made with a sacred intent to live purposefully here with that intention. And so we see that uh, we, are, we uh, practice our cultures, our languages, our arts, our stories, our laws all reflect that elemental nature of our relationship then to what grows up around us. Uh, Blaine mentioned this too, that uh, we have these relationships uh, within the universe. Our, our grandmother, Moon, she impacts on that. The original people were instructed, you should live according to clans. So let's pretend we're all Mohawks a long time ago. Okay, don't start fighting, but we're long Mohawks a long time ago, and we said we're going to divide up into family groups. You're going to be the turtles. You know. You're going to be the wolves. You're going to be the bears. And you're going to be headed by a clan mother, so you can see. And all the paintings that I included here, the ones that aren't uh, acknowledged are ones that I did myself, even though I'm an art school dropout. So that clan mother helps you get connected to all the people in your clan, but the clans help you get connected very directly to the earth, right? So I'm a beaver clan. So everywhere I go, I'm thinking about that. What, you know, where's the beavers? What did they used to do here? How come I'm so hungry for wood? <laughs> so <clears throat> we're told that in order to live well, and like I said, we need to, to divide the, the, these clans, but also then we're going to find a way in which uh, we can uh, entertain ourselves. And one of that was to play lacrosse. It's the game of this land. It was born here. It was first played on this Turtle Island. And it's a great game. I don't know if any of you have actually seen a, a real, uh, a real Haudenosaunee lacrosse game. But it's given us to delight the people. And luckily, if things work well, it'll also carry us to the 2028 Olympics in Los Angeles, where lacrosse is going to be introduced as a new Olympic sport. We just have a passport issue with the Olympic Committee, but we're working on that. So we were given a path of life to follow. When I was a young man, I, I did this collage of myself, my first son, and this kind of native icon. And I was thinking about that, how, you know, my grandmother's generation passed away, my dad's generation passed away, and it's my generation will pass away. But there's always somebody like Blaine to step up and to say those words again, to continue that thing, to plant corn again, to do those things again, play lacrosse again. And that, I don't know, it's kind of amazing to me. We have kind of a seamless transition of our culture. It just keeps going on. Colonization tried to disrupt that, but we'll talk about that in a minute. 
So we were given this path of life to follow. And part of that was this message that was delivered here by the peacemaker and his helper, Hiawintha. It's basically our law. It's called, it's called the great law of peace. It's encoded in these wampum belts. It talks to us about how we're supposed to uh, live together as if we're members of one family, speaking with one mind, and, and uniting our strengths together. So it's a great, uh, how do you want to say it? It's a great way of defining pace as people of the longhouse. Five, then six nations joined together under that one roof. Those wampum belts that the peacemaker brought, we still have them to this very day. We can actually recount the words that he shared with us, and that's an important part of our tradition. And about 100 years ago, many of these wampum belts were taken away and locked up in museums. Part of my job, along with others, has been to recover them. And I'm happy to say today we, we have repatriated a, a, about 400 different wampum items from museums and historical agencies. Our chiefs, as we can see here, our leaders, have now spent the last decade going around to each of our communities and all of the different in the United States and uh, Ontario and uh, Quebec to recite the words of the peacemaker because it's almost like the wampum belt is like our cultural tape recorder. It captured that, and now we can share that. And that, again, connects you not only to place, but you think about it. The words of the peacemaker direct us how to live in this place, defines who we are as a people. So it's kind of amazing to me that we still have our own sense of law. Museums also captured the artistic heritage of my ancestors. You know, when I was a kid, you didn't see great works of art in our community that our, our ancestors made, because they were all locked away in museums. A lot of them sat on, on storage shelves. We never got access to them. Well, because of the work of the last uh, two generations of our people, we've gone into the museum, and we're deriving understanding from the work that our ancestors made. And each artwork tells us a piece of the story, tells us about who we are. But also, we notice, each generation adds to that understanding. So some people make things the same way their ancestors made them, and then some people make some new things, a new way of interpreting what their ancestors said. And that creates a very interesting legacy. See that cradle board on the left? That's the one I made. I carried all of my kids on that cradle board. I don't know if it did any good, but uh, I, I did it. <laughs> it actually gives them a flat rear end, and they don't fall off the couch very easy. So that's been a help. Because <laughs> all they seem to do is watch TV and play video games. All right, I think we're stuck here. All right, I apologize for this. Uh, it's, I'm going to have to kind of move a little quicker through that. And also, we've had to make accommodations to the newcomers that I mentioned. Every year, our leaders go back to Canandaigua. There's this rock there. That's where our treaty that you mentioned was signed, 1794. And this is the wampum belt that was given to us by George Washington to commemorate that agreement. So we recite the terms of the treaty, and we hold that wampum belt, and, and, our, and our hope is that one day the Americans are actually going to step up and fulfill their responsibility of the pledges they made to our people. We've even taken that wampum belt to the White House in what they call the treaty room, by the way, to try to get this thing going again. This isn't ancient past. This is about today. But as always, we find sometimes it's very hard to get the attention of politicians so maybe we need to go directly to the people. This is one of the earliest known photographs of me when I was a kid. And you can see I was uh, colonized into my cowboy behavior. And my, uh, my poor brother Jim is uh, lying on the ground uh, because uh, of my 45. I grew up watching Tonto and the Lone Ranger on TV, watching these westerns where the natives were always the bad guys. When we were kids, nobody wanted to play Indians, you know. So we emulated our captors. It was kind of like a Stockholm Syndrome thing, you know? And we've had to survive a very harsh history. I don't mean to make light of it, but the residential schools, they tried to militarize the imposition of Christianity, uh, English language, and culture and traditions. 
So I was, was watching all of this um, pomp and circumstances about the queen passing. I couldn't help but say, there's the people who did this to us. Their institution is thriving. Look at all the gold and all the jewels and all of that. Where did they get all of that? From indigenous lands. So they're, and they mentioned the reconciliation necessary between the, the crown and Ireland and Scotland and Wales, and that's good. But they also have another reconciliation they have to do with their treaty partners here in North America. It's a picture of my father, Stan Hill, and my brother, Russ. Ironically, they're building Clemens Hall at uh, the University of Buffalo. My father and my brother built the building that I ended up teaching in, uh, named after Samuel Clemens. That's a whole other thing, but anyway. Um, <laughs> and I found it ironic. That's how quickly we move through things. My dad grew up as a farmer. He becomes a deep sea diver in World War II, then he becomes an iron worker, you know, and builds the infrastructure. We build the buildings and, and the bridges that don't belong to us. It was kind of ironic. So myself, Warren Lyons, Sir John Mohawk, and Barry White and others, we went into that building to reclaim our place within the academy. We carved out Native American studies, said that we're, going to, we're now going to represent our voice in that. And I, I always uh, uh, honor that, uh, what took place at UB. Uh, this is the 50th anniversary of our Native Studies program. For 50 years we've been doing this. People should be totally educated about this, but it doesn't quite work that way because of those papers. We're never finished. <laughs> the other thing that they tell us is you have to look carefully to the earth, as was mentioned. You're going to see the faces of the coming generation. We go through this life, and then we pass away. Like my daughter here, Robin, she died when she was quite young. And it puts it back into the earth. And that her body, it's kind of like it's a regenerating machine that then produces the new life for the future. So when you see all these plants growing, you see all these trees growing, guess who's under the ground making all of that come up? Thousands and thousands of generations of Ongwe Owen people. Their, their spiritual energy fuels that. And that spiritual energy, because I'm an old hippie, so I call it vibrational energy, you've got to catch the vibe. The earth vibrates, <clears throat> our mother. The bones of our ancestors vibrate. So that when we sing and dance like they did last night, that vibration that comes from the drum to the voice, it goes through the ground, goes to the feet of the dancers, everybody you get moved by that. Because that's the essence of our life, that vibrational energy. When you get disconnected to that, you, you don't feel like you belong anywhere. So this is why our ceremonies are important, and singing and dancing is very important to our people. Uh, I want to try to get through this uh, a little bit quicker. So like I say, when they tell us to uh, look to the earth, to see the faces of those coming generations, they also tell us, <clears throat> be careful where you plant your feet. Which means, make sure what you do doesn't inhibit the ability of the, of the faces coming to be born into a world that is healthy and happy. <coughs> All right, we're almost done. Today, our young people are insisting that our land rights be respected all across the territory of the Haudenosaunee, I dare say all across North America. It's called this land back movement. But part of that movement they're asking us, and this is where you come in as well, to, we have to rethink what happened in history. We've got to rethink the people that we thought were heroic in one generation. We found out later they're, they're not. We have to rethink our relationship to the indigenous people. And so I think that's what institutions like yours can provide, is some avenue to do that, some way in which you can reconnect. Uh, a friend of mine, Daniel Coleman, wrote this book about a biography of his backyard in Hamilton, Ontario. I'm not paid by him, but I recommend everybody should get this book, read it, and then write a biography of your own backyard. Uh, what it was like before. Who used to live there? What happened to them? That's the living history. And that connects you directly to your place within this large uh, universe. 
and I think that would be very helpful. I wish I brought some that I could sell to you outside in, uh, in my uh, car, but this is what you'll have to look for. <laughs> But as we think about this, we have to ask ourselves, is there a future for this place where we all are? Prophecy and science are coming together to inform us that uh, everything I talked to you about this morning is at risk, everything. The environmental holocaust that we're facing is going to change uh, all of this. So we have to think about what is it that indigenous people can offer us to help us rethink our relationship to this place, to reconnect it in the kind of profound ways that I've been talking about, so that in the future, uh, the water is not undrinkable, the air is not uh, unbreathable, that, that the earth won't withhold its sustenance from us. Because whether we realize it or not, we depend on that happening. Right? I know they're trying to make uh, artificial food but artificial food feeds artificial people. We're the ongwe ongwe, the real people, the original real people. We all got to get back to that. And maybe it asks us, do you have enough vibrational energy to make this thing happen? What can you bring to that? Not only personally, collectively, but to your organizations to, great, to create this great conversation about our future. And I think that's what museums and cultural centers and historical agencies provide, a safe pace place for this dialogue and then maybe we can redefine our relationship to place and maybe we all need to sing and dance a little bit more so with that I'll quit talking and to say Yahweh thank you and I hope that there is something in here that you can take home and talk to your kids about thank you Apologize for my over, overly dramatic exit, but uh, <laughs> we have some time for some questions. And yes, we're, we're, we were debating about who's going to be the one to have to tell Rick that he has to answer questions. He has to answer to you. <laughs> uh, there are some microphones, I think, in the, in the back there. So have at it. Somebody, somebody, somebody please ask a question. I can explain anything but the technology, so. <laughs> well, we're waiting, I'll tell you a quick story. Like I said, I worked at the Historical Museum when I was uh, quite young, I think it was 1974. And I have to acknowledge my mentors there, Dr. Uh, Walter Dunn, who was the director. He helped to organize the first repatriation of wampum back to our people in the modern era. We returned several thousand wampum beads. And I worked with a woman named uh, Eleanor Rigo. She was the uh, head of interpretation that taught me how to actually uh, work with people who come to visit the museum. So uh, I just wanted to appreciate the, the, their, um, how do you want to say it, their nurturing of my museum uh, addiction. Do we have a question or? It's hard for me I to do. see out there. Yes. Question. It's a very basic question. Can you hear me? Is this working? Um, you mentioned the book Yard Work, which yes. turns out at a quick glance is a very popular title for books. Oh, could you, yeah. could you uh, tell us, uh, put the image back up, tell us the name of the author again? Daniel Coleman. He's at the uh, professor at McMaster University. So it's called Yard Works, A Biography of an Urban Place. Yes. It's an easy read. Hi. I'm curious if you, over here. Yeah. I'm curious if you have a, an opinion on the practice of doing land acknowledgments. I think it can be somewhat controversial and 
I'm curious if you have thoughts, because a lot of museums are thinking about doing that work. They do them at the beginning of programs. Is there a, a best practice or a way that you think that feels more authentic about how an organization could start that work? The best practice, time tested and true, is what Blaine offered this morning. To ask the local indigenous people to acknowledge the land in their language the way that they do it. But you're right, the current uh, land um, acknowledgement is, uh, is a good idea, but it just created a lot of feistiness on more people. Whose land is it? Who has the right to submit a land claim? So it's always, uh, it's always a little uh, uh, tender. But if we say nobody owns the earth, we are of the earth, that's a different kind of acknowledgement, and I think an important one. Even though we respect Seneca territorial issues, Tuscarora territorial issues, we are all of uh, our mother, and nobody owns her. Yes. Oh, the right-handed twin. <laughs> thank, thank you for sharing your stories and your wisdom with us. And so my question is something like the first question. Um, I'll ask it again. We. Our museum has not been kind to Native people. Uh, we're a museum in South Texas. We are going through the process of finding the best way to provide a land acknowledgement uh, statement or process in our museum. And so I, I guess that I'll, I'll ask it in this way. What is the best process that you could share with us of how to find that? how to develop a good land acknowledgement that is respectful to the many indigenous people in our, in our region. Um, we're, we're trying to figure out how to start that. Well, I'm working on a museum exhibit in, uh, up in the Muskokas, and it was uh, the hunting lands of the Anishinaabek, the Haudenosaunee, the uh, Huron-Wendat, and the Métis people. So we just say that in our acknowledgement. This land was, this, this place was important to all of these people. Many cultures passed through here. Some set up their villages there. Sometimes we fought each other over that place. But I think acknowledging all of that, the, the original people who walked that land, and rather than get into uh, an ownership thing or, or credit as to who's there last, I think it's important to, to look at that. So when you can find out, what were the ancient native people there? Did we know their names? You know, who, who was there at the time of the arrival of Columbus? Who was there when America was uh, formed? And you acknowledge all of those people have connection to that place. And I like with a dish with one spoon uh, because I kind of the one who began to push that over in Canada saying the land provides us this sustenance and that's what we're acknowledging. That's the reason why everybody came to that. Uh, to Texas, why everybody came to Oklahoma, why everybody came to Western New York, because the land produced such a bounty. Okay, I don't know about Arizona and New Mexico, but anyway, that's a whole other story. <laughs> yes. Hi, um, my name is Shirley Hudson Hill, and I grew up on unceded Mi'kmaq territory on the east coast of the land now known as Canada, and I live and work in Dakaranto, or also Dish with One Spoon um, territory and Treaty 13 territory. And I'm wondering uh, beyond land acknowledgements. Uh, in our conversations with some of my colleagues here this morning, it seems like a lot of us are on this path of decolonizing um, sites. I work at Fort York National Historic Site, an 1812 military site. But I'm interested in pushing that even further from decolonization to indigenizing our spaces so and our places and our land. So And putting us on a path to land back. How can museums and historical sites and history places, I guess beyond land acknowledgements, what are those steps we can take to indigenize our places, spaces, and land? So what I showed you today, it's really all about relationships, whether it's relationships to the earth, with each other, to, uh, to the newcomers. And so what I, all I can suggest you do is you have to do that hard work of building relationships with indigenous people. Uh, you have to find uh, uh, willing and capable candidates to join your board of uh, trustees or directors and, and then you have to make sure that the staff is diversified. But here's one of the dilemmas. 
everywhere I've worked, everybody expected me to represent all of the indigenous people of the Western Hemisphere. So I did. Uh, <laughs> I said what I could about what I know. That's why meeting with the Lakotas and the Haidas and the Hawaiians, it was all important to me because I had to learn some of their story so that I could represent it well whenever I get that chance. Here's what my dad told me. He said, you may be the only native in the room. You have to speak for all of those that will never get into that room. So you have to learn, you have to do your homework. And so, uh, and I think, uh, although we started this a long time ago, uh, Raleigh Adams was involved and we started a training program to help train native people in museumology and, and um, heritage uh, uh, conservation. We still need more of that. We still have a difficult time coming up with enough native curators to be hired uh, in these agencies to be able to do that work. So it's a small network of people. Years ago, I was the president of the North American Indian Museum and Cultural Centers Association. Talk about a name. Uh, I, my, my, my card had to fold out three times just to... <laughs> because we tried to organize back in the 80s how you could connect with uh, indigenous museums, indigenous university programs. There's a lot of great stuff going on, so if you have questions, uh, there are people now that you can connect to. So look at the indigenous educational agencies in your, in your region, uh, get a dialogue going with them, uh, finding those uh, active graduate students who are very interested in looking for something to do, uh, find a way to bring them all in. But it is about building that relationship and that family and it can take many, many years. And sometimes people expect miracles to happen, but you also have to go through this period of decolonization. You gotta hear some rough things sometimes. You gotta hear some harsh things sometimes because the history of museum and native people has not been a, a pretty one. And sometimes you catch all of the blame and all of the heat, whether you're native or not, right? Uh, so we're really good at throwing stones. But one thing I learned in Hawaii, they were able to build a fort overnight with those stones as a defensive mechanism. So maybe that, if we work collectively, I think we can rebuild these cultural centers and museums to be more reflective of the people in their backyard. One more. I hope this is a good segue to what you just mentioned. I think many of us in museums understand, uh, have come to understand museums as we know them are inherently a colonial project and that they're as a, a the form of gathering items and displaying them in a, in a static building and now delivering programs and interpretation, that, that that's an idea that has come from the European presence and the European tradition. And I'm aware that there are, as you showed us in the wampum belts, indigenous ways of telling histories and indigenous ways of remembering things that have happened on the land and ensuring that future generations learn them. So what I wonder as we're engaged in this long decolonizing process can you talk to us a little bit more about the indigenous ways of knowing and sharing history and whether you think those can merge and become part of the museum project or whether we'll evolve towards something completely new um, as we further indigenize? Well, I believe it's possible, in fact, because I've been trying to do that uh, all my, uh, my museum career life. If you look at the project at Ganondigan, what they've done there, uh, even though it's funded by the, the state, operated as a state historic site, indigenous people are, uh, planned the whole thing, planned the land trails, planned the interpretation, do the uh, exhibitions. So it, it goes back to that. The problem here where you get into, sometimes oral history is in direct opposition to written history and archeological history. So what they did at uh, Cahokia, that place I mentioned, St. Louis, they tell multiple points of view. Here's what archeologists say about this. This is what native people say about this. So you don't always have to be the voice of God saying, this is what you must know. But instead we say, here's a question about this place. Here's some voices that, what do you think happened here? What do you think is the story of this place? So I kind of like that dynamic because we're in that era of learning from each other. But what used to irk me as anthropologists, ethnologists, and historians, we're so stuck in what I call intellectual myopia that, uh, uh, that they couldn't see the other side of the story because they're looking for empirical evidence. Well, there's nothing more empirical than what our ancestors have done for 10,000 years, time tested and true. 
our knowledge. It's our story about that place. It's not, it's not a story that needs to be uh, vindicated by science or history. This is just our story, our feeling about this place. So I think that's an important part is also getting into that. And I think the young families are looking for that. They want more philosophy. They want more spirituality. They want more deeper connection, meaningful connection to place. And I think the indigenous dialogue provides them with that. Anyway, unfortunately, I know we've got some other things to go on to today, so I really appreciate you taking the time to uh, share these ideas with you. And there's some other Native uh, participants here in your audience that I encourage you to speak with. Me, unfortunately, I have to run. I still have young kids back at home, and I promised my girl when she got home from school I would be there. So thank you very much for being here, and we'll see you again.